In this video, I'm going to share with you three critical tips that, if you apply them on your exam, will improve your score. Hey guys, this is Mikey with AVO Prep Academy, and on this channel, we talk AP Bio content. In today's episode, I wanted to share with you guys some words of wisdom that I wish someone would have told me when I was in school. Yes, all those years ago. Now, the first tip is to never get overwhelmed by an experiment or background information. This is one of the most common problems students face when taking the AP Bio exam. Diagrams like these or tables like these can make your heart beat faster than your mom texting you, what's this in your bag? It was oregano, I was in home ec. But the point is that this is a test that asks you reasonable questions. In fact, you can solve a big portion of these free response questions without even knowing what these diagrams or the tables are saying exactly. So even if the background information looks frightening, you do this. First, take a deep breath. Second, try and get a general sense of what the experiment is about. You might be able to do this by looking at the graph and seeing what they're changing to observe the dependent variable or the two columns of the tables that portray some relationship. Third, try and see if you can isolate which units or sections of the course the question specifically pertains to. And lastly, try and solve the questions. You'll see that as you begin to solve them, the easier the passage actually becomes. Most part A's of questions, as you can see here, generally ask about the background biology that relates to the answers, such as what the function of the mitochondrial inner membrane might be or what a chlorophyll molecule does. Part B relates mostly to interpreting experimental design, like knowing what controls dependent variables and independent variables are, so definitely keep sharp on those skills. And part C typically relates to the interpretation of data, and it's really only in part D where you really begin to play around with the conceptual diagram. And by the time you get to this last part, you might already have figured out what's going on in the question anyways. The second tip is not to get lost in the details. Imagine that you're looking at a mosaic painting. That's sort of what AP Biology is like. Each individual bit of detail is fascinating, sure, but that's not what we're here to see. Sometimes we need to take a step back and understand how the small bits end up creating the whole. And just like that, the AP Bio exam is less concerned about each and every enzyme that catalyzes glycolysis. Sure, you might see phosphofructokinase and GAPDH as examples on the exam, but that's not really what the point of the question might be. The main focus is connecting ideas to the broader biological themes and implications, and of course, how understanding those units play together in explaining some biological phenomena. Let's take a look at that phosphofructokinase as an example. If I were a college board, maybe I'd use this enzyme to test students' ability to recognize negative feedback loops where ATP as the final product of glycolysis and cell respiration allosterically inhibits that enzyme. Speaking of which, I might even ask how the enzyme loses its ability to proceed when inhibited. Structure and function is the answer, by the way. Or I might even say a mutation that reduces this inhibition became more prevalent in fish populations living in cold conditions. Why? Because with more ATP production, there's more metabolism. And with more metabolism, there's a greater amount of heat being produced, and that might help the fish in cold water survive better. And that allele that forms that mutation, well, that will be subject to selection. But I think you get my point. These are the connections that AP wants you to make, so don't get lost in the detail. Take a step back and enjoy the grand image that is the study of life. The third and final tip is to understand the limits of AP Biology. What this means is that you have to have a pretty clear understanding of what you're expected to know versus what you're not expected to know. This comes in handy in both MCQ and FRQ. On the MCQ, answers that are way too specific or contain niche knowledge about a system are sure to be incorrect. On the FRQ though, this plays out a little bit differently. Sometimes students simply freeze because they don't think they've learned enough about cholera or malaria or pancreatic cancer to even begin writing their answers to questions that reference these ideas. But a question that says, why does the leaving of chloride ions result in water loss in cholera? Well, they're not talking about cholera per se, they're asking about osmosis. Of course, if ions are moving from one side of the membrane to the other, osmolarity there would increase, resulting in a hypertonic solution that draws water from the cell. That incidentally results in diarrhea in cholera, but the question was really about unit two. The point is, the better you understand the limits of what you're expected to know, the better you'll handle the questions that appear challenging. Let's take a look 
look at one more example. In 2023, they asked how scientists could use comparisons of DNA sequences of different organisms to infer evolutionary relationships. This was in reference to ruminants, and the worst thing to do here would be to begin talking about those ruminants. This is a general biology question asking about phylogenetic relationships. Students who couldn't figure out how these cows and giraffes were related failed to even answer the question, while what College Board really wanted was very simple that there is a positive relationship between the number of nucleotide differences in genes and the amount of genetic divergence or the elapsed time since the last speciation event between those two species. This captures the very essence of what we need to know about using molecular data to infer evolutionary relationships, and that is where we needed to draw the line. I hope this short video has provided some food for thought in your approach to studying for this exam. This might also mean that you may have to change the way you think about your study plan, but what I'm talking about in this video is quite possibly the most important set of ideas in tackling this particular test in the way that it was designed. And of course, if you found this video helpful, consider clicking that like button and sharing it with a friend. This has been Mikey with Able Prep Academy. Have a good one.